We are all shaped by our environment, by our relationships, by our experiences. Let me go ahead and tell you uh, just a, a little story about my younger self. Uh, for those of you who, who don't know, I grew up as a pastor's kid, so I was in the church all the time. Uh, and growing up, because that was my, my, my environment, that I, I would always look up to people in that kind of sphere. So preachers, pastors, leaders, um, they were the people I was around and I was like, man, I want to be like them. And so I want to take you back to the, the fateful summer of 2007 when I attended my first Big Stuff conference. And for those of you who don't know what Big Stuff is, it's just a week-long youth conference on the beach in Panama City. Um, what could go wrong? Uh, it's just a beautiful, beautiful experience. And every day, you know, you, you have uh, worship experiences every, every night. And, and that week, there was a guy, his name was Casey Darnell, who was the primary uh, worship leader uh, for the week. And Inevitably, I was just like, man, this guy is so cool. He's just super humble, super kind. Got to interact with him a couple times. And, and I really just like, man, I want, I want to be like this guy. And so, but there's something about him that's, that's kind of important to this story is that, that all week he uh, wore these really deep V-necks. And so freshman Samuel was like, oh man, I want to be like Casey. And so uh, you probably know where this story is going. This is a picture of me in high school um, and I had this, I became deep V Samuel. And so the entirety of high school, I wore these, these deep V's. I had some that were deeper than this, but I, I wanted to stay appropriate for church. Um, but, but, uh, I, thankfully I repented in college. I thought about wearing one today, but, uh, uh decided not to, but we, we all, we want to become like uh, the people we look up to, uh, the people who influence us, who impact us. We often hear sayings like imitation is the greatest form of flattery or you become whatever you behold. And these things ring true for a reason, because we're humans and that's how we become. We're in the process of becoming like the people around us, the environments around us. We're shaped by the events of our lives. And so the question is, uh, this morning, who and what am I being formed by? And what would it look like to instead be shaped, formed, and influenced by Jesus? And these are the same questions we're going to be looking at in our, our text today. And we're going to encounter three different groups of people. The first is the Jewish commoners, the, the common uh, man and, and woman the second is the Jewish leaders, and the third is the disciples, and they're all going to respond differently to a work of God in this moment in Acts. And so before we dive into the text, I want to remind us where we've been. This is week three of Acts, and, and we've seen Jesus ascend into heaven to promise the Holy Spirit. Last week we celebrated, we, we, we uh, recognized that Jesus has sent the Spirit in Pentecost. Actually, this morning happens to be Pentecost Sunday in the global and historic church where it's celebrated we, we studied that last week, that the Spirit was given, that, that it fell in power and, and tongues were spoken and, and people, 3,000 people came to know Jesus. And this was all fresh in the minds of the people that we're going to be spending time with this morning. And so we're going to start in Acts 3, just at the beginning. I'm going to be summarizing a bit throughout. This is a longer story, but you can kind of follow along. We see two of the disciples that we, we probably are familiar with, Peter and John, and they're headed to the temple to pray, which would have been their rhythm, their normal thing, to go to the temple to pray. And a lame man was sitting there, someone who couldn't walk, begging for money, for alms, for anything. And so, so Peter and John, they're walking. And Peter says, look at me. Look at me. He says, I don't have silver and gold. But what I do have is in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And this man gets up. He starts leaping around. It would have been a sight throughout the entire temple. This man, who'd never been able to walk, can finally walk. And this is the incident. The work of God, the miracle that we're going to be sitting with and seeing the reactions of people throughout this morning. What a beautiful, beautiful narrative. A man who could not walk, leaping, like a deer, as Psalm says. And this is where we pick up in Acts 3, 12. The people are astonished. And this is Peter's response to them. When he saw them, he said, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? 
Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? So I want to pause here for just a second. This is that first group of people, the Jewish commoners. They're astonished. Peter's saying, why are you so surprised? Their response could be summarized in, in three words. Surprise, confusion, and maybe ignorance. Despite everything that they had seen in the previous weeks leading up to this, this healing was surprising to them. They were not expecting it. That Even though the rumors, even if they weren't there at Pentecost, the rumors of what God had been doing, the healings, the, the rumors of a resurrected Messiah, they, they didn't know. They didn't believe. They didn't expect God to be working. They had lost any imagination for what God might be doing in their midst. And so this event was surprising to them. And so I ask us all this morning, do do you have an imagination for what God is doing in and through and around you in your everyday life? Are you ignorant of what he's doing or are you expectant? And so as we we move on in the text, Peter's response is like, it's all about Jesus, that, that you handed him over to be killed. But God raised him. We are witnesses of this. That's a common theme, this idea of being witnesses. But, but through trusting him and through his faithfulness, this man was healed. And he challenges these common people to respond in this way in verse 19. Repent then. Turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. And so Peter invites these common people who were surprised by this, who had not known God working in this way before, to repent. That they would be freed from their sins. They would experience times of refreshing in the presence of the Lord and that God would come again to restore all things. So we see here repentance is changing direction to trust and walk with Jesus in his way of life. We see ignorance, surprise, confusion. The invitation then is repentance. We're called away from ignorance into repentance to know God intimately and to expect for him to work. And so in this moment, you're like, oh my gosh, we're already at the end of chapter three. So I'm going to break some rules. We're going to go to chapter four today. I got Eric's permission, so... Uh, but we're, the story continues. That's why we're going to keep going. And we're going to see the second group of people. And so this incident in the temple caused a lot of a, a ruckus, a commotion. People were like, what, this guy, he's, he's walking. And the leaders are starting to get nervous. And so they arrest Peter and John. And they bring the lame man with them. And, and they keep him overnight. And they, they confront them the next day. Something else to take note, though, is that 2,000 more people came to know Jesus through this event at the beginning of Acts 4. But, but they bring them, the rulers come, and they ask them this question in verse 7. By what power or what name did you do this? The Jewish leader's response, by what power and what name did you do this? Did you heal this Man, and so we pause again, the second group of people. They are driven. Accusation. Who gave you the right? Who gave you the authority? What rabbi, in whose name are you doing this in? This was very important for the first century Jewish leader that you do things either by God or by, or by Satan. So who are you, whose power are you doing this in? And so their response is fear and control. We need to control this narrative. We need to arrest these men. We need to keep this under wraps. We need to stop this from spreading. They were threatened by this disturbance. And so various different kinds of leaders would have been there. The Sadducees are listed. They didn't believe in the bodily resurrection. And so Jesus threatened that. This story threatened that. The Pharisees and many priests would have been there. They believed in ushering the kingdom of God, the the reign of the Messiah through holiness, through through purity in a very specific way and keeping the law. And and these Christians are are living different. They're they're threatening that. They're not tied to that anymore. 
Many, many of the other rulers were in, in league with Rome, that they were, uh, through compromise, trying to, to maintain peace. And this unrest, this excitement was, was threatening that. So these, these rulers, these Jewish leaders and authorities, they had a lot to lose if they could not get the situation under control. And so Peter's response to the Jewish leaders w- w- was, was similar. He's like, what can we say? It's Jesus. You killed him. God raised him. Salvation is found in no one else. And it was in these moments that they start to realize that there's something unique about Peter and John, which we're going to get to in a minute. But they can't deny that the miracle has happened, that the, the man is standing right there, the, the lame man who could walk. And so they, they, they resolve to instead just be like, hey, you guys need to stop talking about this. You need to stop witnessing to this incident and to Jesus. And this is their response in verse 19. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. They cannot deny their experience, their time with Jesus, to know the resurrected Lord, the power of the Spirit. And they instead challenge the leaders. Consider for yourselves, what is obedience? What should you do? Because we know what we need to do, and we can't stop, being, stop talking about this. And so the leaders, they're in a lose-lose situation, and so they decide to just let them go because the people would riot if not. And so in the Jewish leader's response and Peter and John's questioning, this is what we see, that we are called away from control, from fear, from con- controlling the narrative, and into surrender and obedience to King Jesus. So we see these two different groups of people, two different responses to this miraculous incident. This lame man who can now walk has the freedom of leaping when he's been bound to the ground. And in the common Jewish people, surprise, confusion, ignorance, what, what is this? What is God doing? In the leaders, fear, control, stop it. And this is where I want to turn. And with the remainder of our time this morning, I want to shift the focus towards the disciples, these two men who we know as Peter and John. What can we learn from them, from their presence, from their response, from what these people saw from them. What was it that that set them apart to be able to respond with such boldness, with such courage in the face of wonder and accusation and simply point to Jesus? I mentioned earlier that these these leaders noticed something unique about these two men, and this is, we're going to head back to verse 13 of chapter 4. This is what the leaders see. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled and ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. They saw. These these were normal guys. They were ordinary. Just like you and me. But the thing that set them apart was that they were with Jesus. And so I ask this morning, do you want to become someone who is known for having been with Jesus? I want to take a step back for just a moment and, and, and look at the relationship that Peter and John would have had with Jesus. What, what would the leaders have been seeing? And I think one of the, the crucial things for us to understand was that these leaders a lot of them were rabbis. They were in the Jewish, the first century Jewish culture and they would have been like, man, these guys have been hanging out with Jesus. And what that meant for them is that these guys were his disciples. Now we hear this word often, but what does it actually mean? Let's put it in that first century context. And so in the Jewish world, there were, th- there were three kind of phases that, that Jewish kids up to age 12 would, would learn the Torah, the first five books of the Hebrew scriptures, our Old Testament Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They would have memorized them. They would have studied them up to age 12. That's called Bet Sefer. 
And then they would move into a second phase of education, of, of growing up, of being trained. It's called Bet Talmud. This is ages 12 to 16, and it was kind of the cream of the crop would move on, and they would memorize. They would study the rest of the Hebrew scriptures, the prophets, the Proverbs, the Psalms, the books of history. And then the best of the best, if, if you were lucky, a rabbi would come along, a teacher would come along, and you would get tested by this teacher, by this rabbi, and they would choose the best of the best from everyone and say, come, follow me, be my disciple. This was the Jewish way of doing life, of learning, of training up people. This is significant because Jesus called these unschooled and ordinary people, these guys had failed out of rabbi school. They had been overlooked, which is why they took the chance to walk with Jesus. The Hebrew word for this phase is Talmudim, disciple, apprentice, follower. And this is what we see in Matthew 4, verses 18 through 20. This is Jesus. This is an example of this. As, as he was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. He said to them, follow me and I will turn you into fishers of people. They left their nets immediately and followed him. Jesus taking on for the first time in his ministry the role of a rabbi, come follow me. Be my disciple, my apprentice, my follower. And in this passage, Peter and Andrew, yes, we will. They immediately left their nets, their families, rearranged their lives to be with Jesus for the next few years that would set them on the path to where we see them in this moment in Acts. So we see here that to be Jesus' disciple is to learn to be with him in all of life. Our calling as followers is to learn and sometimes relearn what it means to live a life with God. Humanity once lived in harmony with God in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 2, we see this. This was God's original intention and desire. He marked us. He set us apart for relationship, for life with him. But in our sin and brokenness, we chose a different way, a different path. Of, we tried to do life without God, and that led to, to death. But God's desire to be with us never changed. We did. And this is why Jesus came. God took on flesh in Jesus to bring us back to God, to set us back on the right path of a relationship, of union, of communion with God. And he teaches us how to walk with him in the kingdom of God. This is the gospel and discipleship Walking with Jesus on the road is at its center. This is how God remakes us into his image. This is how he's chosen to do it. Luke 6, Jesus says this, everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. And so we are called to a life with Jesus in order to become like him. This is exactly, I would suggest, that set Peter and John apart to these people in this passage in Acts 3 and 4. They were ordinary, and yet their time with Jesus, and now being given the spirit of Jesus, has set them apart, and they're seen as extraordinary. Our calling, our invitation, is to live a life with God in the spirit. But there are two temptations that we will likely face, all of us at some point in our lives, that hinder us from this kind of life. The first temptation is this, to live our lives without God. And you might be thinking, Samuel, that's kind of an obvious statement. And you're right. But this is similar to the way in which the Jewish commoners reacted to this miracle, to, to the, the work of God in the temple of this healing that occurred. <clears throat> they had no imagination for what God was up to. They were not living their life looking for God. 
They had lost hope and faith that he would be with them. They had not been taught to live with God as Peter and John had. And this is something we struggle with greatly, daily. We're so busy, hurried, distracted that we are functionally living our lives without God. Imagine with me, we all know what this is like. You wake up in the morning, maybe you sleep through your, your alarm, and so you're rushed, and you get up out of bed, you, you throw something into your mouth, maybe, maybe the kids kept you up late, or you just didn't sleep well, some indigestion, you, you rush out of bed, you're, you're, you're running late for work, so you rush out, out the door, and, you, and, and you're, you're so anxious, and you're so hurried that you know, there's someone actually going the speed limit, and you get really angry at them because they cut you off. And you get to work and you're just all, you just, you're not even composed and you, you're so behind on everything and you're, you're, your boss gives you a new project or a new assignment and you're like, oh my gosh, this is, this is way too much. And you're the whole, you spend the whole day wrapping your mind around what this might look like and how, how are you going to get this accomplished? And you, you skip lunch because you're too busy and you're too hurried and, and you're just pounding coffee just to stay awake and stay attentive to, to keep your energy up, to get everything done that you need to get done. And then you reach the end of the day and, and you're finally getting home and and, and, and you, you grab fast food on the way home because, you know, you, you miss dinner and you get home and you, you, you get upset with your spouse because they're just not greeting you with sunshine and rainbows. And it's, you're frustrated and you're like, fine, I'm going to just go watch some TV. And you go binge watch, you know, Stranger Things season four or, or, or whatever's on, your great uh, British baking show or whatever's your thing. And you finally lay down to go to bed and it hits you. You never once acknowledged God's presence with you today. And if you're anything like me, this is a temptation. And it's not just a temptation, it's happened before. And it's not just happened before, it probably happens a lot more often than we'd like. All of life is pulling us away from a vision of a a life with God. It's a familiar experience whether we're pulled away by technology or by family or by responsibility, we forget that God is with us. This is the kind of person that Craig Rochelle calls the Christian atheist. He says that uh, someone who believes in God but lives as if he doesn't exist. And studies in recent years have shown this. 70% Uh, 76% of Americans will say that they identify as some kind of Christian, but only 7% of Christians are actually living a life of discipleship to Jesus. It's the kind of world we live in. A world where it's natural, easy, to forget about God. So how can we relearn to live our lives with God? The second temptation is to live our lives for God, but not with him. So some of you struggle a lot with the first one. Many of you struggle with this one. This is the temptation the Jewish leaders faced, of controlling, of doing all the right things to please God. We're going to go after all the things we know we should do, but we're going to miss the presence of God in our midst. How often do we strive to do the right thing for God in order that he's happy and pleased with us? How often are we compelled to fight for him in a way that he never asked us to? How often are we tempted to take things into our own hands and do God's work for him? How often are we driven to sacrifice things for God at the expense of our relationships, of our souls? Whether that's serving, being in a small group, reading our Bible, fill in the blank. How many things do we do for God? And we forget to be with God. This is our tendency. In Genesis and in Jesus, the first and primary desire, priority of God is to be with us. He wants the best for us. Jesus embodies the life with God. And he invites us into it. Come to me, stop striving, rest in my presence. This is the foundation of discipleship. Jesus says this in in John 17, verse 3. Now this is eternal life, that you may know God, the Father, and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. 
Eternal life is found in no one else other than a relationship to God, with God. It is not a transaction, it is a relationship. And I do want to say, doing for God is not a bad thing. But when we get mixed up, we, we prioritize the wrong thing. This is what we see. When we prioritize living our lives with God, then our lives will bear fruit for God. But when we miss that, our lives will stop bearing fruit. Abide in me, and you will bear much fruit. If we don't abide in him, we will not bear fruit. This is the way of God. This is the way of Jesus. This is the way of discipleship that we're invited into. But how do we live this kind of life? How can we become the kind of people who, like Peter and John, are recognized as having been with Jesus? So we come to a familiar passage to most of us. Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations. We think that this is the command of the Christian life. And it is. It is the mission that we follow. We make disciples. We are disciples. We are disciples who make disciples. This is the foundation. But there is a second imperative statement that is often missed in the Great Commission, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those are imperatives. Those are results of discipleship. The second imperative is found instead in verse 20, which says, Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This word, surely, sometimes translated as, as low or behold, it means keep your eyes on me. I am with you. Do not forget that. We are to make disciples and we are to remember that God is with us in every moment of every day as we are going about living our lives with him. This is the invitation to us this morning and every morning. But learning to live with Jesus takes practice. So I wanna leave you this morning with a very simple practice, inviting you to try this week. It's what the ancients have called breath prayers and it's just a, a, a short, Phrase that you can say under your breath throughout your day to remind yourself that God is with you. Here's an example of one. I am one in whom Christ dwells and delights. I am one in whom Christ dwells and delights. Christ loves you. He's with you. He delights in you. This is the foundation of everything else that flows out of a life of discipleship. So I want to invite you, a simple practice, whether it's this phrasing or, or a different, God is with me, throughout your day, when you wake up in the morning, when you eat a meal, anytime it comes to mind, before you go to bed, I am one in whom Christ dwells and delights. Let's ground ourselves in an imagination for what God might be doing and an expectation of what he's up to all around us, of surrender and obedience to him, that he is with us in every moment. He has always wanted to be with us. That is the beauty of the story we get to live out, the gospel story, God with us, revealed and finished in the person of Jesus. This is discipleship. You are one in whom Christ dwells and delights. Let's pray this morning. Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our King, we come before you and we ask that this week, maybe for the first time, that we would have a new awareness, a new imagination of, of, of your presence with us that we would not live our lives without you or for you, but foundationally with you, and that out of that flows the goodness, the joy, the peace, and the love of the kingdom of the heavens. Teach us to be with you as you are with us. 
Let us not just celebrate communion together. Help us to live out a life of communion with you. We love you. We pray that this would be so and true of our lives.